Hi there, I'm Penny Johnson. I'm a classically trained pianist with somewhat of an athletic background. And in this video, I'm going to be showing you how I use my body to get maximum control of the sound. You'll hear me practicing invention number 12 in A major by Johann Sebastian Bach, but you can apply these concepts to music of any style. Let's get started. These six tuplets. I'm trying to use them to, in such a way to create some spin, some propulsion to them. It's an abstract kind of an analogy, and it has nothing to do with tempo, but it has like, <clears throat> like push and creating thrust and propulsion. If you think of a roller coaster, that, that trip up is a lot slower than the trip down, that momentum of the descent. It's that kind of gesture I'm trying to create with my arm by shifting my weight, rotating my weight, just like in a golf swing. When you, when you bring your club back, you got to rotate your body, your hips, everything, shift your weight. And then the downswing is the you know, the corkscrew <laughs> coming undone kind of thing. It's that same kind of idea, but here we're obsessed with sound. We're, we're using the body and, and movement uh, effectively not to get points or to score a goal, <laughs> but to make a beautiful sound. So on each of those uh, six tuplets, I'm imagining a kind of this kind of gesture, yum, bum, 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 bum. and the bottom part of that circular gesture is the, the propulsion or the momentum of that roller coaster, and then the, the top of that circle is the, the, the effort to get back up, the struggle. It's, this, uh, this is what's going on in my head as I'm trying to figure this out. I've got the Goldberg variation number 26 too, which also has six tuplets. This one? That one, six tuplets all throughout the piece. And there we have more of this uh, stepwise motion. Very much like the opening of this invention number 12. Those descending notes at the end of the sextuplet, the Goldberg number six, 26, those ascending stepwise notes, these are places that you can look to springboard to shift your weight. You can see how far my arms are moving away from the body. A lot of students sit very upright with no forward bow at all, and they're playing largely from the knuckles. It may be right notes and right rhythms and basically secure, but it doesn't have like torque to it, right? And, and the thing that's so fun about box music is creating that spin, like the golf swing analogy, being able to hit the ball far and having it feel good because you used your body effectively. Basically, on each of these six tuplets, going back to the invention, I'm imagining that on the front of each beat, or each six tuplet, my arms are releasing away from the body, like this. Now, how much of this versus how much of that, one way or the other, will depend on the kinds of intervals within that beat. It's always changing. It goes up, it goes down. Sometimes it's by step, sometimes it's by skip. Right? But in general, for each of those beats, try to feel a release of the arm, and not just your forearm either, but your upper arm. Hopefully you can see my upper arm releasing from away from the body as well. In conjunction with that release of arm weight, which also should help to feel good. It doesn't only help to create spin 
in these sextuplet figures, but it feels good and it produces uh, better contact of the fingers with the key. Uh, you have to remember that your fifth finger and your thumb are a lot shorter than the rest of the fingers. And so to com we compensate for that at the piano by rotating. Um, so it's the arm and also my torso, my upper body, uh, I'm leaning forward and back for pretty much each of those beats. Let me do it slowly. This is not a lullaby, <laughs> it's not a saraband, it's not a minuet. This is a fairly dynamic, spirited, quick, lively piece. And we want that spin. When you got sex tuplets, capitalize on creating as much thrust as you can. So we get something like this. And then, you know, it's like the train is moving. It's not just kind of crawling along and stopping at every, every local station along the way. It's moving. This is the express train. It's got a well-built well engine and a lot of, uh, you know, <laughs> gas in the tank or a fully charged battery, however you want to look at it. So this use of the body. I want to show you some footage here of my golf swing. <laughs> from a few years ago at the driving range. And I had golf lessons uh, many years ago. I was quite athletic back in the day. The study of the golf swing, uh, there's all sorts of things I'm thinking about when I'm addressing the ball. My stance, the, where my feet are pointed, uh, how far apart are my legs, which club I'm using, my grip and the angle of my grip, the, the angle of my arms to the through to the club, uh, my head position, the rotation, the shifting of the weight, the upswing, the position of the club, keeping the head down, the downswing, and the follow through. It's very complicated. And I, I don't get the sense that a lot of <laughs> musicians, classical musicians, are, are very interested in sports. That was certainly not the case uh, when I was away at school. <laughs> They were all, all, all afraid of, of hurting their hands, but, but I, I wasn't. So, I mean, I didn't want a broken knuckle, but I wanted to play. I like sports. And uh, trying to analyze, uh, analyze mechanics, swing mechanics, or if it's hockey or whatever. I did martial arts as well and basketball, you know, when you're doing the free throw, you know, you're trying to f figure out how to leverage your your mechanics to nail that basket every time to get the ball in the net to get your ball in the cup in as few shots as possible whatever it is or to get to the finish line the fastest the difference here at the piano is that we're not looking to score points we're looking to communicate through sound so this use of the body i want to talk a little bit too about the ornaments because that is a very challenging aspect to this invention number 12 and a number of other pieces as well, the invention number four. These long trills, I'm imagining a gradual acceleration of speed up to the uh, working speed of the trill and then a slight deceleration. Because it's like when you're driving your car you, you don't uh, immediately go from park to full speed. There's an acceleration and then you brake and you slow down. Same thing with the trill. This is a fast piece, so it will be a fast trill, but I wanna ease into it. Let me play for you this trill very slowly, starting with the little turn that comes before.
then the little mordant at the end. I'm not concerned with the number of rotations. In other words, how many times I'm doing. I'm not concerned about. Some people are. Some, some people can count as they play. I personally cannot. I'm using my ear and I'm relying on a, f a firm pulse and they're just fitting in naturally. But when you're practicing trills, try to feel them so that they're not like a jagged saw, you know, like very angular, up, down, up, down, and certainly not completely in time with the other hand. This to me is very unattractive. Where the right hand trill is exactly in time with the left hand. You want your trills to be decorative and to sound natural, like they're literally, like a vibrato almost. So think of the trill, practice them as though they were triplets. And just forget about the opening turn and just take the two notes, C sharp, B. So actually I'm doing two triplets, so a sextuplet. Yum, bum, 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 bum. But I'm not doing it in time with the left hand sextuplet. It's more staggered, something like this. And especially the exit of the trill. When you're exiting a trill, the, the last couple of notes, aim for clarity. So much of the time, the exit of the trill gets smudged, and we get something like this. where the two notes are basically played at the same time. But the last note is, uh, the last note of the trill, especially in this piece, has a tie on it, so it needs to sustain. Uh, and hear that last note. This is not a piece for a beginner, certainly. It's not super advanced repertoire either. It's, you know, late intermediate. Um, if you've not played extended trills before, though, it would be helpful to practice them as uh, starting simply as a two-note slur. So I'm going to take my C sharp and B. With, you notice, I'm coming from above the keyboard. I'm landing on the key for the C sharp. Then my wrist goes well below the key. It's down here over the key bed. And then as I play the next note of my pretending two note slur, the wrist is coming up and pulling the hand out of the key. That's the general gesture of the hand and wrist for, for, the, for a trill in general. So down, up, down, up. And not just, I mean, it's great if you can get your wrist to do that, but that's not enough. The body, the upper body has to be also involved. So as your wrist drops down, your torso from your sitting bones or your hip, uh, lean forward. And then as you lift your wrist up and you come out of the key, your torso moves back a little bit. You're still slightly forward, uh, bowed forward towards the keyboard, uh, even when you're upright, but there is that additional forward leaning into the piano on the uh, initial attack of this trill, or in this case, the simplified two note slur. So down, up, down, up, down. And if I just do my torso alone, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, down, up, down, up. So try to combine those two things together, the down, up of your wrist combined with the front, back of your torso. And then when you go to, when you're comfortable with that, start adding some more rotations and leave, leave the turn out, uh, the first couple of notes, of the trill, leave those out and just practice the trill. Take two rotations. If that's too fast, and the way you know is if it sounds like this. 
really squeezed or pressed, like it's falling down the stair syndrome, <laughs> I like to say. That's not an attractive trill. But this... And you want to get like with the basketball where you can do your free throw shots a hundred times and you never miss, you never miss once. You want to get that with the trill. Those are all pretty good. There was one in there that had a little bit too much of an accent on the thumb where we had this kind of thing. The B, the thumb. Mm, mm, it's like a thud. When you're playing ornaments, whether it's a mordant or a trill, push off on the front note. Emphasize the front note. Don't bang it with an accent or play it for triple fortissimo or anything like that, but emphasize it. And we do that by, again, engaging a flexible wrist, release of the arms away from the body, and front back motion of the torso in conjunction with that releasing of the arms. Fingering is helpful too. You know, if you're trilling a black to a white versus a, versus a, I don't know, a two whites maybe, maybe you'll use a different fingering. In this case, starting the turn with two, three, and then I'm beginning the trill with four, two, and then I'm switching over to three, one, because this is a very long trill. It lasts two beats, half of a bar. If I try to do the whole trill with the same two fingers, it starts to get lumpy and uneven, like a wheel on a bike that is kind of warped. And yeah, it's turning, but it's not working. It's not functioning at its maximum capacity. Um, so change them up, fresh fingers. You can hear the difference, right? Here's a trill where I'm changing fingers. You can see me, I'm, I'm trilling 2-1, I'm switching to 3-1, to 4-1, to 3-1, back to 2. I do have a touch of pedal down there, um, but I think that's certainly fine here. Not much, just a little bit, to help blend the sound. Otherwise, it sounds like rubbing alcohol. It's a little antiseptic and dry, sterile, but a bit of warmth, a little bit of sauce <laughs> on the pasta would be nice here. A little bit of pedal. So that is something to try, and of course the left hand has it too, and it's the exact same concept. I want to scooch over to the sequences. We have one, well, there's a few of them, but the one I want to look at is measure seven and eight. And so here, Bach is going downstairs. <laughs> These sequences are descending. It's the passage like this. It's seven. Right? So whenever you have a sequence, try to look for some essential blocks, main points of the foundation. <laughs> so I'm hearing the C sharp in the right hand against the A going to the D of the right hand and the F sharp of the left hand. Then the B of the right hand against the G sharp of the left. It goes to the C sharp in the right hand, E sharp in the left hand. And then we're in measure eight, A in the right hand, F sharp in the left. And finally, B in the left, in the right hand and D in the left. So this is, this is those isolated notes from the sequence. Measure seven and eight. That's all these are, thirds, very warm intervals. So you wanna play that a few times, just those notes. Get them in your ear so that when you play the whole passage as written, it, it holds some, it's like some notes have been highlighted. We can hear those sparkle through and the rest are more in the background. Let me try it again. And now those notes that I played, some of them are eighth notes. 
So you want to give those a little bit more release of the arm away from the body to help the, the tone of those notes sustain and to project. E singing can help. E um, bom, 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 bom. And then the sixteenths, just breeze through those. And again, you use uh, creating that propulsion, <laughs> the roller coaster analogy, from to create thrust and swirl from your from your upper arm. It's very dynamic and swirling and exciting to listen to, and of course, it's alternating left, right, left, right before the. Both hands are finally together in measure eight with sixteenths. And we're in F sharp minor there. And that is, I think that the tone is quite brilliant and intense there. Let me back up a bit. Uh, let's take it from the top. notes in the left hand especially ah oh, well we had them in measure two and measure two that was fun give those some you know some extra gravy on them really articulate them these are not delicate notes here but the one at measure 10 there dig into the key and let those notes be heard In that spot, measure 10, end of the second beat, right hand. That's another spot where we have this descending stepwise motion in our right hand. We talked about that in the beginning. And those, as I said, are places where you can really capitalize on that roller coaster spin, thrust, swirl effect. Um, the, the golf swing, you know, the upswing, and then the powerful downswing. The upswing is slow, right? There's not, that's, you know, but it's the downswing. <laughs> but yet the upswing creates the wind-up before the unleashing of it all. So try to think of those uh, stepwise notes in the, in the sextuplet as the unwinding part. You don't want to let your tempo run away, but the release of the arm weight, just ride ride the downward or the upward gesture with uh, a very relaxed arm that, that is flexible and mobile. There's another sequence too, similar to that one we just heard in, uh, this one is at middle of 16 into 17 where we get the same thing, a series of tenths or thirds, however you want to call it. So listening for those notes. So that when we add the, the missing notes, so you really have to rotate and not just rotating on a flat line, but rotating on a curve. My teacher in New York used to talk about transportation on the piano. When you get from point A to point B, when you have to cover a big distance, you do it on a curve. You don't just stay on a flat plane, like the airplane when it travels from Toronto to Vancouver. <laughs> it's a whole lot faster. Have arc a curve to your playing whenever possible so that you can minimize the distance you need to travel. And then the last thing that I wanted to say, there are some places in this piece, such as measure 12 and 13. It's mostly the left hand. I got a broken C sharp minor chord, so four notes there. You're, you're going to need to compensate for the little thumb and the little fifth finger by rotating so that you have a good grip over those notes. And what I like to think about, uh, I'll use the F sharp major one in measure 13 as an example. My third finger on the A sharp is a kind of a, a pivot, 
right? So you can practice that way to help with your transportation. And the third finger, too, is the longest finger. It's a very strong finger, much more so than your little pinky, certainly. If you're playing a note with your fifth finger and you can manage to play it instead with a stronger finger, like finger three, then by all means do it. You get better control. And as you pivot left to the F sharp with your fifth finger, the, the, uh, the hand and the arm are moving to the left so that your pinky can get more traction. And the little fifth finger, your pinky, it's curved too, right? I'm exaggerating it a little bit for you to see. It's that kind of idea. And then the same thing on the top with the thumb. The thumb is on the F sharp. You rotate your hand and your arm to the right. It's the mirror image in your left hand, in your right hand. Um, and the first joint of your thumb is curved, so you have good traction there. Everything is very loose. And when you rotate your arm to the right for that thumb note, your upper arm is going to be very close up against your, your torso, as opposed to when you go down uh, for the fifth finger, it's going to open up. And again, your torso is moving front and back to accommodate all this. It is something that takes a lifetime, always trying to refine these things. We're trying to get it so, again, so that it has thrust and swirl. Where every note is sparkling clear like, like a Vermeer painting and you swear you were looking at a photograph, right? That's how I like Bach to be played, very clear. <clears throat> but with good tone. If I'm not rotating, then you'll hear this kind of playing. Where there's a wobbliness between 3 and 5 and between 2 and 1. It's that loose wheel syndrome. Get out your wrench, tighten up the bolt, lean forward a little bit, rotate, and you get... You have to come out of the key very soon and quick, too. It doesn't mean that the tempo is fast, but come out of the key. No lazy, sleepy fingers. So it turns out that sports are not just good for your health, but also for your piano practicing. I hope this video was helpful. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you again soon in the next video. Bye-bye.